Um, hello. Um, some of you may be ex-students, if so, welcome back. If not, welcome to NTU Brackenhurst. This is Melanie Benson, which we've already met, showing around uh, some stuff. Um, you're in the right room if you're here for a season of clear, clear wing moths. Um, just a little bit about Melanie. Melanie is a conservation officer at the East Midlands Butterfly Conservation and has worked with the organisation since 1993. Mm -hmm. Melanie started her career in conservation in 1998, starting with a phase one of Nottinghamshire. And just on the way up here, it's also told you were a student at Brackenhurst. Yes, uh, twice. Twice. So wow. <laughs> that's interesting as well. Uh, she has experience with ecological consultancy, local authorities, and Oxford University. Melanie has been researching the ecology and conservation of clearwood moths in the East Midlands, two species of which are reg of regional conservation priority. Uh, I'm not used to public speaking, so I'm glad I'm in a smaller room. Um, if we can just hold any questions for the end, yep. um, but so I don't give too much more away, over to you. Thank you, thank you. So this project was born out of Seven Tread Water's big nature recovery boost. We got some money about three years ago now to look at our rarer butterflies in the East Midlands. And the first thing I did was say, how come there aren't any moths on this list? Because we have regional priority moths as well. And I'm looking at a lot of other things besides clearing foresters. I'm looking at marsh carpet. I'm looking at argent and sable over in Derbyshire. I'm looking at a four-spotted moth in East Nottinghamshire. Um, I did look at a little tiny thing called licorice piercer in Rutland for a little while, but it's probably much found all the wild licorice is going to now, so I've written the project, done that, it's just being adjudicated. So I'm returning to my first love, the clear wings and foresters. Um, when I was little, I went to visit my grand quite a lot, and she had an AA book of the road, and I would pore over that every time I went to see her after looking around the garden, and I, there was a big section on clearwing moths, and I remember staring at them, gazing at them longingly. No idea that 40 years down the line I'd be researching them for butterfly conservation and writing a book on the East Midlands clearwings and foresters, which would probably start about 2026, 20, 27, something like that. When I first started the project, I pretty much got all the literature I could find on clear wings and I devoured it in a couple of months. Um, there really isn't a great deal and most of what there is is this is what they look like, this is what lure they come to and that's it. There's one book that does the genital look dissection under a microscope but you don't need to do that for British species. So we have 12 species historically in the East Midlands. Um, six belt had been one of the more frequent ones. Um, really, unless you know a lot about larval food plants and things, the only way you're really going to find them is with pheromone lures. Six belt had been one of the ones that responds most readily. We went to Bevercut's pit in July two years ago and we put the lure down, and within 11 seconds, there were 28 on the bag. <laughs> Somewhere to try to mate with the bag. That's how enthusiastic they are. They don't all do that. In fact, hardly any of them ever turn up in any great numbers. So we've got about a thousand species worldwide. They're nearly all in the tropics. So Central Africa, across through Asia and into Malaysia and off into the North Pacific Islands, north of Australia. They are all stem borers or miners, and some of them cause really serious economic damage to crops. Um, the larvae can be up to three years, possibly even longer in a few species in some individuals, some cases like the Scottish Highlands and the northwest of England where you don't get much of a summer in some years. Um, obviously eating that sort of pith. If you've seen the specimen that's gone round, they haven't eaten the hardwood in the middle, they've gone down into the root system and bored in and eaten the pith in the roots and they've just tunnelled up to the surface to make that little hole to escape. So the pheromones were first synthesized probably about late 90s, early 2000s, principally as, killing, as, a, as an adjunct to killing agents in the Far East. And then it transpired that people realized what these Chinese people were up to and they thought, well, how come we can, we can buy into that, we can use them, we can, they can synthesize the, the female attractant chemicals 
we can use them for a more benign purpose and attracting feelings in this country. And I read the Atropos book magazine from 2001 too, and it was like, wow, isn't this brilliant? This is going to overturn all clear wing recording. So all the clear wing maps in there have basically exploded, well, nearly all of them, since the advent of a pheromone. Because otherwise you had to know an awful lot about larval food plants and when to go and look. Um, so we had them in about 2000, 2001, they were brought out for trial, and the only one that didn't work was for lunar horning, which is the one at the front. It attracted a few other kinds of moths, but not, not the one they wanted. They had to go back to the drawing board. So when you bought a clearing set of lures from Anglian Lepidopterists until 2021, you would not have got an active lunar horning. You had to buy it separately. Um, so it was two years further on that that started to, record started to explode because people were using a lure that actually worked. It's actually our most frequent clear wing. I won't say common because none of them are common. You won't see lots of them unless you go to a specific site for six belt. But a typical pheromone lure is a red rubber bungee. It's been imbued with the chemical. Um, the other one is, if you can see there, there's a, a little plastic file. It's empty, but it's been imbued with the chemical. Apparently, if you take the lid off, it loses its efficacy very, very quickly. Um, we bought the full set of lures in 2022, and I put in the budget, we'll have to replace them within a couple of years. No. You keep them frozen when not in use, and you don't handle them with your fingers, and you don't get them wet. They can last 20 years. Some of the guys have said, well, I bought the very first set of lures in 2001, and they're still working brilliantly now. So um, it's a good investment if you want to sort of look at what's on your site. I'd recommend it to quite a few conservation groups that they buy five of the commoner ones, seven pound fifty each, and a couple of quid for postage is, you know, a good investment if you're going to be doing any long-term studies and things like that. Um, you can buy the big six, you can buy the big ten, but you've always got to buy Luna Hornet separately. Um, I've got nearly the full set. There's only a couple of species you're not allowed to lure for, which is fiery down in Kent. Um, but that's getting more common, so maybe if the law changes and that is not Schedule 5 anymore, there'll be a lure developed and you can go looking for it. When I started, there was a bit of concern about control of use, how often it would be done whether we are actually um, attracting them away from their natural habitat and what they're supposed to be doing. I don't really think that's so with how I'm using it. Um, I do rather get a bit upset with the hang it and hope brigade that buy a lure, stick it in their garden, let it go for a few days, and then go, oh, I've got a dead red tipped in my bucket. Where's that come from? Even if it's still alive, where's it going to go back to? That's what's causing the disruption. I'm going the length of going into the habitats. I know enough about the flora and the larval host plants to actually say, this is a good spot, that's a good spot. I never leave a lure unattended. Not even, well, not, not, not literally leave the site, but I don't stand by it, but you know what I mean. Um, well, we did say we would use a maximum of three sample days per season. Some of them, clear wings, are not very readily responding to lures, and some of them are very, very specific times of day as well. But I've seen behaviour not documented before. So two species of clear wings, six belted and yellow legged, you can tell the males and females apart reasonably readily once you've seen a few. Twice now for six belted and once for yellow legged, I've seen males and females coming in separately land on the lure bag, they've caught it, they've paired up and mated. So I'm acting as a dating service pretty much, <laughs> I think. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really worried about sort of disrupting mating potential. Um, six belters, as I said, will swarm the lure bags. And I always get females, but more of that later. So we've got 16 species in Britain. The dusky was found two years ago. Um, still, nearly all of them are nationally scarce. Um, Lunar Hornet is the only one that isn't, but I'm expecting this to start changing in the next few years. An example, when I, before I started looking at Red Belt of Clearing, there were four knots records. When I finished by the end of last year, there were 15, and I just went to some open gardens and dangled my bag around 
and we got them in six out of eight sites that we visited. And two of those might be because the tree just wasn't quite old enough. But seeing as we're in Nottinghamshire, I'm concentrating on Welsh and large red belt, and as they are our regional priority species, they're not found anywhere else. Um, large red belt was in Derbyshire till 1977, and it was in Leicestershire till 1984. We've lost them. Um, people have been looking, I've been looking in some of the old Derbyshire sites, and it doesn't seem the same as it was from the recorded descriptions from the 70s. Uh, we've lost one site to quarrying in Leicestershire. Button Quarry, the old ancient uh, uh, birch woodland, disappeared in the 60s and early 70s. So I'm not surprised that they're not there anymore. But the aim of the project is to conserve our property species, well, all of them really. The standard uh, questions that you ask when you're setting out to do an ecological survey. Um, these are the ones we have in the East Midlands. We've had 12 historically recorded. Um, Probably still got white barred over in the Derbyshire Staffordshire border. Um, Welsh has only ever been in knots as far as we know. We've got nine colonies of Hornet now because we've lost the Derbyshire one. Orange Tail is moving up through Leicestershire and Rutland, so we might get that in South East Knox and South Derbyshire pretty soon. Um, yellow Leg is important in Sherwood Forest because we've got an awful lot of those big old oaks that they like. It's uh, not massively rare, but it's a tier down from the loon of only Welsh and large red belt, so it's like a second tier of rarity. Um, I'm writing a paper to Natural England on behalf of the Sherwood Forest Trust to say um, Sherwood Heath, that that sort of area is of regional importance for clear wings. We've got a big proportion of the Welsh and large red belted. We've got a high proportion of yellow legged. There are probably others in small numbers that we don't know about yet, but anything with more than four clear wing species is going to be a pretty important site in my book. Um, red tipped are all through the Trent Valley, there's even some here. Apparently there's a couple around the lake at the bottom, down by the Dumble. Someone did it, took a lure out in back end of June, two years ago, and got one. Um, I'm happy to come and, and if anyone wants to come and have a look for those this year. As soon as the large red belt and Welsh season is over, I'm going to start looking at other things. Um, six belted is really much everywhere there's enough birds for trefoil. It's on all the old cold tips. Um, Sallow was new to Leicestershire in 2023. It's one of these ones that has a very strict two year cycle, so there wouldn't be any seen last year. But as I've got a few sites to look at for this year in South Derbyshire and um, North West Leicestershire, so if anyone wants to come along and help me with that, that's absolutely fine. Um, White Bard, I'm pretty sure, is still in the Derbyshire, Staffordshire fringes. I looked at the habitat in the wild, wild forest last year. I can't see any great difference between that and the Dove, Dale and Manifold Valleys in Staffordshire, Derbyshire border. Um, hasn't been seen since 1885, but for all that time, no one's had any lures. So unless you're very, very adept at looking at older stumps and finding out what little holes are causing them, you won't find them. A bit more about what we're aiming to do. Um, there, there isn't a lot of understanding about larval ecology. There really isn't. I'm pi hopefully pioneering some new aspects I'm running through the Evidence Committee from Butterfly Conservation. I wrote some reports last year, got them out by the end of November. I really had hoped that I would have had them verified by now. I've heard nothing yet. But I really want to roll this out to a lot of people because it can make a massive, massive difference, especially to large red belter. Um, as I said, with the big nature boost, a little bit more effort, and we really can expand our biodiversity gain for very little money, if not no more money. Just tweak how we do things and when. If we're gonna stack timber on the track side, it cuts down all the coarse vegetation. We just basically rotivate it. Um, I've collected some birds for trefoil seed from quite a few sites across the county now. It's in my freezer right now. You've got to vernalize it. Sow the seed back out on the site. Hey presto, you've got another dingy skipper scrape with seed collected from the actual site. 
and Ollerton and Pitwood, before we had the fire, Six Belt had had colonised the birds from Strathfield on the new scrape that had been put there the year before. So we know it works. It's a matter of scaling it up. So we've been looking at um, cars from residents of Nottinghamshire. There are very, very few records. Like I said at the start, I wanted to look at museum specimens and it soon became apparent once I had that dead one why there aren't any. Um, basically, car, the bar car book gives clearings very, very short shrift because nobody really knew much about them. The very few records are all itemised. The only one that's at all widespread was current clearing because a lot of people had kitchen gardens back then and it was a pest. So our understanding has leapt on from, from, from Carr's day. Finding the ferry, ferry manures of the really brought the recording evidence on. One London collector apparently went to central Wales and um, managed to persuade someone to fell a load of birch trunks and bring them back to London in the hope that he would have Welsh kiwi larvae inside them. History doesn't say whether he was successful or not. But that's the kind of lengths people were going to to record them in those days. So the rise of ferryman lures, it's still very patchy. This is why I'm, I'm sort of doing the project, because there are little areas of hot spots where there's lots of records and then there's huge areas where there's absolutely nothing at all. South Derbyshire, there are very, very few records. That's a map that Steve Mathers produced for me from 20. 10 to 2022. Um, I'm hoping by the end of this season we'll have another map where you can see where the, the hot spots are and you can see where the not spots are. And the big concentrations around Leicester and Nottingham and to a lesser extent elsewhere in sort of Rutland and everything is pretty much where all the recorders have lived that have put recorded clear wings. Um, some of the records around Nottingham will be mine. I think uh, some, some of those will be mine as well. There'll be an awful lot more. So large red belted is the first of our two conservation priority species. It's probably much more widespread in Sherwood than we thought. There are three meta populations. Um, one of them in the centre parks bit, which hopefully I'm going to get access to fairly soon to look for larvae. One I found on Sherwood Heath last year, all he's found the larvae, and we've got one record at Clumber Park. It's the first of the clearings to emerge, and quite often it's under the radar because not many people start looking before the middle of June, and it can fly from early May, even late April in the south of England. Sussex, Surrey, Heath, it can be an end of April species. And they don't tend to last very long, probably only a fortnight, three weeks, and then that's it. That's probably going to be safer because it's probably going to be seen all over the place soon. It's the one I found in May last year on Sherwood Heath. I was doing a guided walk. I went to look for woodlarks because I turned up an hour early. I just happened to stumble across that on a cut birch stump and it was sunning itself. I've got a little video of it walking along and it's wiggling its abdomen. And I didn't know why it was doing that, but it would walk along, have a little wiggle, fly down. This is this is where I found it. This is the stump. And it would go down to the cracks and crevices in here, and it would disappear into those for a minute or two, and all I could see was its head. And then it would come out, go back on the stump for a bit, sun itself, have another little wiggle, and go and do the same. And I showed the video to someone from head office, and they said it's positioning the egg in the overposition tube. So that's the kind of habitat we're looking at. This is Sherwood Heath. Um, there's a couple of pylons going straight across this. You can't really see it in the picture, but they're, um, the power line company are pollarding these birches, stop them going up and interfering with the, with the uh, electricity cables and things. And in so doing, they're creating habitat for large red belt at clearings. Um, I've got another guided walk training day on the 26th of March. We're going to go up here and look at some of these cut stumps. See if we can find any fresh larval signs from last year and two years ago. Um, this is where I found them 
new to that bit of not, so it was a sunny, nice sunny day early June. There's nothing better to do. I'll go and dangle the pheromone lure about and it took a while to find, but I got I got two in this area and then I went last year and had a load more. So one of the one things I'm trying to pioneer is management and large red belted do not have traditional post trees as such. Um, that's the two larval holes. I don't know if you can see, but there's a bit of sort of brown stuff in the middle. They're the remains of the pupil case. So they'll lay in the creviced bark, and it's probably because the eggs could be sensitive to ultraviolet light. They want to keep them out of the way of spiders and centipedes that might eat them. But also, I think within the deep crinkles, the bark is thin enough for the caterpillars to actually bite through it and get to the living tissue because they're eating the living tissue. So the, the darker brown rim on the um, stump across there. But they'll tunnel down into the roots and there can be two years, possibly even three. We don't really know at the moment. And then they'll, when they're ready to pupate, they will come up to the surface, they'll bite, they'll chew their way through, they'll leave like a little flap like we open the tin with a tin opener. They'll push out the frass if they have to. They will pupate literally just behind the flap. They'll stick the flap down. And then when they finish, when they emerge from the pupae, they've got like a little head capsule with some spikes on it, like a chick has an egg tooth. And as it pushes its way out, it ruptures the membrane. And sometimes the larval case will actually flip out and it turn itself inside out, like a sleeping bag. You're trying to get out of a sleeping bag, but your, your foot's stuck to the inside. <coughs> it turns it inside out and it's visible for quite a little while. Some species more than others, but we're sort of trying to pioneer this so that um, the larvae of large red belt probably will only be one generation in a cup stop because it's two years, it's competing with fungi, beetles, a lot of other things, and just the general drying out of the, the stump. So if we can keep the tree alive and have a cut surface and the egg laying site, hopefully that means that there'll be more generations and it's not having to move around and all constantly in search of new, new habitat. A lot of them must fly out and disappear off into the country that's last we ever see of them because they never find anything all that suitable. So with Welsh clearing, it's found in Sherwood in 2008. I would imagine from the number of larval host trees we found, there were two together with 83 holes in it and clips to an old quarter in January. They've been there a lot longer than 2008. You don't expect to find it, you don't look for it. The guy, Gary Joint, was an RSPB ward and basically he leapt against a, 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 a birch stump having a fag and one landed on his pad. And it's like, <laughs> and it's come from Cannock, well, news populations, Cannock Chase. But I'd imagine they've been in Sherwood for a very, very long time. It's just that nobody's been looking or realised what these holes were. That's what a Welsh clearing looks like. Um, absolutely beautiful. Doesn't do it justice. The little tail fan literally glows bright orange. It's a really, really attractive species. We did a um, event in Choke Forest near the Major Oak in mid-June last year and we got three without any trouble at all. I just basically hung the lure up in a couple of random places and we got several. So um, We were worried about numbers declining. I think that says more about human behaviour than the moths actually. Because they have traditional host trees and they are known about, people who want to see them go to the host tree Stick a lure up, oh yeah, nice one, seen it, click, 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 got it for the year, off they go, post it on Facebook. Someone else goes, ooh, you've seen one, I wouldn't mind seeing one. They go back to the same tree. They're not looking for anything new. And the thing is, these host trees, they could host 10, 15 generations, they're not going to last forever. They're going to get mined out, a few more moths are going to go, hmm, not really sure this is the best place for my eggs, and off they go somewhere else. So the pattern we're finding, is we're finding trees with a huge number of holes in, between 83 and 50 odd, and then 50 yards later we're finding ones with 20 holes in, and then 50 yards later we're finding ones with 10, and then 2 or 1. So they are fanning out. I think there's the same number of moths, they're just widespread over a bigger area, and it's just potluck people in the past have lured quite a lot in one place. 
if there's a mass emergence, you're going to get a load and then they disperse. I think that's not typical of Welsh clearing. I think there's twos and threes scattered all around. You've got to work harder to find them now. There's a lot of host trees that have got loads of holes that are just probably, they're done. They've been mined out. Female moths don't find them all that attractive anymore. That's another view. That's the typical host tree. This is Sherwood in the old car park. Um, the yellow and green thing at the bottom is one of these um, trap buckets that I have. The pheromone is in that little white thing there, and the moths come in through the hole and they get trapped in the bucket. Um, I was looking at them every hour when I had them out in Sherwood. And as soon as I found anything, I thought, right, that's it. We're going to stop, stop luring at this site. Now we've got what we want. Show them to people. Take them right back after the show's done. Let them go. And that's it. No more recording. So I'm not, I'm not pushing all that sort of thing. Um, there was an incident with Sallow Clearwing where someone stuck a lure up somewhere in Leicestershire, left it for three days, came back to find nine dead Sallow Clearwings in the bottom of the trap. I don't think that's a particularly good way of doing things at all. So you've got a duty of care. Basically. Um, multi stem trees doesn't really matter as long as they're probably over 40 years old, and most importantly, they've got that deep fissured bark for the egg laying. Both Welsh and large red belt love to poke their eggs into the really deep fissures. Anything you can lose a pencil in is fine. Um, I'm measuring these trees now and recording the number of holes from the plot on the graph if there's any correlation between trunk girth and the number of holes. What I really want to find out is the time and the condition when the tree stops being really attractive and you get the number of new holes will decrease and I think it'll decrease slowly and then suddenly there'll be a big drop off. I think that's what's going to happen. But another few years of survey to find out. So I'm talking to the RSPB, I'm talking to the Forest Trust, I'm talking to an awful lot of people about management. I want to pioneer some of these things, see where we go with it. We can't do any harm, we can do an awful lot of good, and just one little tweak can make all the difference. It really can. That's a Welsh clearing larval hole. Um, they're usually from about sort of knee height to about shoulder height, though in Clipston we found four that are up here. Welsh don't tend to tunnel into the roots, they will eat the bark and they'll go up and down, and they can be two years, possibly even three. Um, a lot of these holes, you can't really tell how old they are. Um, they could be generations old. It's looking for adult moths in June and looking for extruded pupil cases when they first start flying. Yellow-legged is all over Sherwood Forest, wherever there are great big oaks. There must be a lot more sites for it across our region. They like the really big old oaks, they like the bits where they've got um, canker, they've got cut surfaces where they've chopped limbs off. Um, if a branch has struck, another branch has given it a glancing blow, you've got a, a scar or something like that. That's where you find the eggs. Um, I found it in West Hallam last year, on coal tip site, there were two big oak trees, they were on there. There are no other oak trees for miles, not any big enough anyway. Another one that's rare in name in the books, it almost certainly isn't. That's a yellow-legged clearing. Uh, that's a male with a black tail fan. The female has a partially yellow tail fan. It's a late summer one, back end of June, and they fly well into August. They flew well into August last year. I think August the 16th, I was still getting them. It's very much an afternoon species. You don't get out of bed before harvest one, basically. <laughs> what we're finding is a lot of these clearings, six belter will respond all day, but they cut off about six o'clock in the evening. It's almost like a plaxon's gone and they said, right, that's it, we've had our work day, lads, let's disappear off. And <laughs> I've put the lure out at 5.45 and got two, I've put the lure out at 6.02 and I've had nothing, even when I know there are hundreds. And that's happened a few times now. They must live such regimented lives, they do certain things at a certain time, and there's a certain bit where these are sexually active. They'll go right through till the afternoon, right through to the evening. We had nine in one in one trap in August at Sherwood Major Oak last year. Red Belted is the smaller cousin of the large Red Belted. 
I said that there were only four notch records before I started looking. I found another 11 sites just by going to allotments and open gardens with the lure in very late June, early July. They live on apple trees and pear and probably cherry and other fruit trees just below the bark. You can find extruded pupil cases of those if you look carefully enough, but they don't really tend to last for long. That was the record, that was the number of records up to 2022. Um, there's a whole big more splotch around South Nottinghamshire and there's some at Bingham where there's a remnant of an old orchard and a, actually an apple tree that grows by the old railway line that probably was a core thrown out of the train in the 1940s or 50s. And they're on that as well. And there's no other fruit trees for a long, long way. So they're very good at finding these things. So almost certainly they're present in Southwell, in the orchards. They could easily be here if there's enough apple trees and fruit trees old enough. They could very easily be here. Again, if there are, I'm happy to come and look. It responds very readily to, to lures. Um, the two sites in Nottingham, Edge Nottingham, that I found last year were old orchards belonging to the Pins Drinks Company that made peri pear and apple ciders and things like that, and they're all left in gardens. Um, it probably isn't all that rare, but it's restricted by habitat, and we're not going to get any old orchards or big old fruit trees anytime soon. So there's a reason, I think, why that should be a, a, a regional priority species as well. That's what it looks like. They're all pretending to be something they're not. All but one of the clean wings have a Latin name that is something formis, which is actually a Greek name. Something formis, which is look-alike. So there's a Ves formis, there's an Ape formis, there's a Tipuli formis. They're all pretending to be something. They're all pretending to be wasps or other insects that can sting. Um, when I was looking at large red belt at last June, they finished flying when I was looking at a stump with larval holes in, and an ichneumon wasp with a big red band on its tummy landed right in front of me, laid an egg in the dead wood and flew off within about three seconds. I have even got time to pick my phone up, but I thought that's exactly what the large red belted is mimicking. And these wasps, either they parasitise grubs in the dead wood or they're laying in the dead wood itself. Those ovipositors are dangerous. You will get them in moth traps. If you're moth trapping anywhere and you get them, please be careful how you handle them. Those little stingers, ovipositor things, are barbed. If they can force their way through dead wood, what can they do to your finger? I met someone once who actually got one stung through his finger and he tried to pull it out the way it came. And of course the barbs stuck out and made an awful mess. So, respect them, be wary of them, but you can see why these moths choose to look like something. That's the bucket trap in an old orchard. We had nine to that within probably less than an hour in early July last year. Hornet moth, sadly, we don't have ten colonies anymore. We have nine because we lost the Derbyshire one. Um, but there's still a few places to look. It's an urban, suburban moth. It's not going to be in places where a lot of naturalists will congregate. It will be in things like shelter belts around industrial estates, car parks, um, like roads. You know, we've got we've got two university campuses, we've got a farmyard, we've got an old gravel pit. Um, places that most people won't bother going, or there might be reasons why you can't patrol around it with a camera, like children, schools, and things like that. It's out there to be found. When I first started looking, I thought, oh, hybrid black poppers, they're all over the place, the moth must be everywhere. But it's not. It's not. There are some very defined features that they want. They don't like clay soil because the larvae are down in the roots, they're going to get cold and wet, and they're not going to develop very well. They don't like ivy or lots of moths, anything that clutters around the bark, stop the females from egg laying or the caterpillars from tunneling in. Um, those holes are about the size of a pencil. They're very distinctive once you know what to look for. So if you do find any poplars, any big old hybrid poplars around anywhere that you live, please, please look. Um, my email address is on the butterfly conservation page. If you look under committee about us, I'm there. I really want to know. And I can come and have a look with the lure. It's not one that responds all that readily. Um, that was the site that greeted me at Ketton in Rutland in June last year. I came just after a really sharp shower of rain. 
Um, I put the lure out, I got two within a few minutes, and then I discovered this one, it's probably been sat on the trunk all the time. It could easily have got knocked out the sky, sorry, by the <laughs> rain. You can see where it's, all the chitin's gone. There's a patch there where it, all the fluff has gone. So I'd imagine that's where the rain sort of knocked it off. It's the biggest clearing we've got. It's got those yellow shoulder patches and the yellow bit of fluff on its face. They do everything a hornet does except sting. They buzz, they twirl their antennae, they pump their abdomen, they dangle them out in flight, they go all the length. That's the pupil case, and that's about twice, about three times life size actually, probably twice the speed. But you can see, are we nearly at the end? Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit between. I think maybe in five minutes, okay. if people are, are having to go into the break, but then it will only be 10 minutes to change. Well, I'm nearly at the end of the nice pretty pictures, so. <laughs> Yeah. The talk was designed to be an hour or so. Yeah. I'm giving it to a lot of people. Yeah. I'm trying to sort of run through the nice bits. There's a lot more text, but I can I can scrub that because I've probably said most of it already. Thank you. So that's the pupil case. Um, typical host tree. You can see all the ground compaction. They like trees that are stressed. A lot of clear wings will like trees that are stressed. Really because if a tree is stressed because it's suffering from disease, or it's got root compaction, or it's suffering from drought stress, or it's got any kind of ailments to it, sooty bark disease. The female moth, the tree A must put off a pheromone lure saying, I'm damaged. And um, the female moths home into it because they know the tree can't really put out a chemical defense against the caterpillars if it's already stressed some other way. Lunar hornet moth, probably gonna be all through, the, all through our region really. Willow rather than poplar, similar size holes the hornet moth, um, the holes were in the slightly horizontal thick branch down into the bark, down into the roots in some instances. That's what it looks like. Um, very similar to the hornet moth, but with a little yellow necklace rather than yellow shoulder patches. Very similar in size, and again, they buzz and do everything a hornet does. Current is our more free, most frequent clearing. Probably, if there's only red or black currants here in the fruit garden, it'll be here. I'm going to have a look later, see if I can find any. Um, that's what it looks like, it's one of the smaller clear wings. That's the larval exit hole, probably about four times life size. That was in cultivated black currant. Red tipped all through knots, all through our region probably. Um, similar to red belted, but red tips on the wings and little white bits on its tail fan. They're in willows all over the place, like I say, there's some here. Six belted is everywhere, entry level clearing. Um, if you buy a pheromone lure to gain your confidence in looking for clear wings, get this one and go out and look on the coal tips. We still want to know where they are. There's still big holes in the records. Wherever you go, if you see any birds for trouble in any numbers, it's likely to be there. Females look a little bit different. They're a bit smaller, they're a bit darker. Um, I'm getting females to the lures as well as males. I'm getting them in about sort of eight to 10 to one. The premise that females can easily expend all their pheromone and they're still looking for a mate. And so if they want to find a mate, they go and look at another female that's um, pulling out her pheromone lure because there's bound to be more than one male. Bound to be, and she'll get made too, and this is what I've seen happen. Orange-tailed is not really an obstacle species at the moment, but it is turning up in cultivated viburnums. Looks a little bit like the Welsh clearing, but is about half the size. Um, white barred, do we still have the species? I went to the wire forest at the end of May, we put a pheromone lure out, we had 14 males in the bucket within an hour. They like alders and things, that's the kind of habitat. We've got that in knots as well. We've got alder lined woods somewhere in knots too. Every chance it's still there. That's what the holes look like in the um, alder <coughs> stumps. Frass in one, sallow, no reason why we can't have it in our region. A um, little bit on climate change and then I'll stop. Welsh is an upland species. It doesn't fly in any heat at all. So the really intense heat wave we've had in June 
2022 effectively cut the flight season in half. We didn't find any. Um, we were two days too late. Um, some had been seen the day or two before, and we put our lures out, and it was just way too hot for them. They just stopped flying. Luckily, there's another cohort of larvae that emerged from the year before, which keeps the species going, but if that starts to break down because of climate change, then we're going to feel this year first, which is why it's important that we keep monitoring whilst clearing and see how it's doing. I'll have to stop it there. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah.